protective equipment in sports and athletic related activity. The selection, fitting, and maintenance of protective equipment are critical in injury prevention. Protection is critical in contact and collision sports. Coaches, athletic trainers, and other healthcare professionals must have knowledge of how and when protective equipment should be used to facilitate rehabilitation and sports-related activity. As the person that is fitting equipment, we must be able to foresee all uses and misuses, as well as warn the user against potential risks inherent in equipment misuse. In the event that there is an injury related to equipment, who is liable? If equipment results in injury because of a defect or inadequacy of its intended use, then the manufacturer is liable. If equipment is modified, then the modifier becomes liable. To avoid litigation, individuals should exactly follow specific use instructions of equipment. If an individual's modification results in injury, that individual and their institution or their employer could be subjected to a suit. This is known as a tort. Equipment Reconditioning and Recertification The National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment, also known as NOCSI, is an organization that has established voluntary test standards to reduce head injuries by establishing minimum safety requirements for football helmets, face masks, baseball and softball batting helmets, baseball and softballs, and lacrosse helmets and face masks. This takes into consideration the type of helmet and the amount and intensity of usage. Direct collision sports require head protection because of impacts, forces, velocity, and implements. For football helmets, NOXI has developed standards for football helmet recertification. All helmets certified must protect against concussive forces. While helmets must be certified, they may not always be fail-safe. Athletes and parents must be aware of inherent risks of participating in sport activity. Each helmet must have a visible exterior warning label, indicating that a helmet should not be used to strike an opponent due to risk of injury. It also indicates the risk of accidental injury and that athletes play at their own risk while using the helmet. Athletes must be aware of the risks and what the label indicates. The athlete should read and sign a statement regarding the warning label. There are a number of helmet manufacturers who have closed due to lawsuits and liability cases. Some athletes don't like this little sticker on the back of their helmet. Unfortunately, if the sticker is removed, then the manufacturer is off the hook for any legal lawsuit that happens due to injury while the individual is wearing that helmet so it's important to educate athletes about leaving the sticker alone. It is important to understand that no helmet can prevent all head or neck injuries a player might receive while participating in football. Helmets cannot prevent concussion or brain injury, and individuals should seek medical advice before returning to play if you suspect any injury. Individuals should be warned not to use the helmet to butt ram, or spear an opposing player. These activities are in violation of the football rules, and such use can result in severe head or neck injuries, paralysis, or even death to the individual, and possible injury to the opponent. Noxie's efforts include the development of performance and test standards for football helmets, face guards, and gloves, baseball and softball batters and catcher's helmets, batter's helmet face guards, fielder's headgear and face guards, chest protectors for commotio cordis and baseballs, lacrosse helmets and chest protectors for commotio cordis, face guards and lacrosse balls, field hockey headgear and balls, soccer shin guards, polo helmets and eye protectors, and ice hockey helmets and face protectors. Noxy has a helmet standard. This is not a worn tee. This indicates that the helmet met the requirements for the performance test when manufactured or reconditioned. 
the helmet should undergo regular recertification and reconditioning every two years. This will allow equipment to meet necessary standards for multiple seasons. Off-the-shelf versus custom protective equipment. Off-the-shelf equipment is pre-made and packaged by the manufacturer, and when taken out of the package may be used immediately without modification. Some examples of off-the-shelf equipment are neoprene sleeves, shoe inserts, and protective ankle braces. While off-the-shelf equipment is convenient and readily available, it can pose some problems with sizing. Unfortunately, individuals may fall in between sizes, which makes a fit not correct. Customized equipment is constructed according to the individual. These are specifically sized and designed for protective and supportive needs of that one individual and therefore fits perfectly. Generally, customized equipment is more expensive than off-the-shelf equipment. This increased cost may be attributed to the time that is necessary for individuals to evaluate, construct, fit, and adjust a piece of equipment. Helmet fitting. Follow the manufacturer's directions and guidelines. We must routinely check our fit. Just because a helmet fit at the beginning of a season doesn't necessarily mean that it fits later. Simple things like cutting your hair or changing a hairstyle can affect the fit of a helmet. Participating in sports at altitude can affect the fit of a helmet. So the way a helmet is fitted should be checked periodically. To properly fit a helmet, we should mimic the circumstances that the individual will be playing in. Therefore, we should wet the hair to mimic sweat during athletic participation during helmet fitting. To select the proper helmet size, measure the circumference of the head one inch above the eyebrows and select the appropriate helmet. First, the air bladder should be inflated. The helmet should fit snugly around all parts of the player's head, the front, the sides, and the crown. A check for snugness should be made by inserting a credit card between the head and the liner. Fit is proper when the credit card is resisted firmly when moved back and forth. There should be no gaps between the cheek pads and the head or face. The helmet should cover the base of the skull, and the pads placed at the back of the neck should be snug, but not to the extent of discomfort. The helmet should not come down over the eyes. It should sit front edge two-thirds of an inch or about two finger widths above the player's eyebrows. The ear hole should be aligned with the external opening of the ear canal. The face mask should be attached securely to the helmet, allowing a competitive field of vision, and should be positioned three finger widths from the chin. The face mask should not rotate when manual pressure is applied. It should not shift front to back when manual pressure is applied either. It should not bottom out on impact. The chin strap should be equal distance from the center of the helmet, and straps must keep the helmet from moving up and down or side to side. It is important to understand how helmets work if you are a healthcare provider. You may be necessary to cut the loop straps the secure a face mask if a spinal injury is suspected or CPR is required for an individual. Remember, certification of a helmet means nothing if the helmet is not fitted and maintained correctly. Like football helmets, ice hockey helmets have been upgraded and standardized. Blows to the head in ice hockey, in contrast to football, are usually singular rather than multiple. It is essential for all hockey players to wear protective helmets that carry a stamp of approval from either the Canadian Standard Association, the CSA, or the Hockey Equipment Certification Council, the HECC. Hockey helmets must withstand high-velocity impacts from either a stick or a puck and high-mass, low-volume impacts. The helmet should disperse forces over large areas and decelerate forces that would act on the head, properly fitting an ice hockey helmet. The helmet should be comfortably snug at the forehead, top, back, and sides of the head. The helmet should not shift or wobble on the head, and this will reduce protection and comfort and could also be distracting during play. 
The chin strap should be adjusted so that it gently contacts the chin when the mouth is closed. The helmet should fit flat and snug on the head above the eyebrows without tilting forward or backward. If the helmet is loose or not properly fastened, it loses its protective qualities. The bottom of a full cage face mask should rest gently on the chin when properly fitted. Baseball batting helmets. These must withstand high velocity impacts. Baseballs can fly at over 100 miles an hour. Research has indicated that helmets do little to dissipate the energy of a ball. A possible solution would be to add external padding. Helmets must still carry a Noxie stamp, just like the football label. There are some questions about how well baseball batting helmets protect against high velocity impacts. The image on this slide are of a batter's helmet, a catcher's helmet and mask, and a batter's face mask and face shield. The use of a helmet with an ear flap during batting can afford some additional protection to a batter. The runner and on-deck batter is required to wear baseball or softball helmets that carry a Noxy stamp as well, which is similar to the warning on football helmets. A cycling helmet is designed to protect the head during one single impact. Many states require the use of cycling helmets, especially in adolescent participants. The guidelines for fitting a cycling helmet. The helmet should be level on the head. If it is not level, adjust the fit using extra foam fitting pads on the inside to provide contact with the head all the way around. With a one size fits all model with a fitting ring, adjust the fit by tightening the ring if needed. Adjust the rear nape straps, then the front straps, to position the Y fitting where the straps come together just under the ear. It may be necessary to slide the straps across the top of the helmet to get them even on both sides. Next, adjust the chin strap so that it is comfortably snug. Next, adjust the rear stabilizer if the helmet has one. Shake your head around violently and push from under the front edge and push up and back. If the helmet moves more than an inch or so from level, tighten the straps so that the helmet is level and feels solid but comfortable on the head. Lacrosse helmets are required for all male lacrosse players. Women's lacrosse only requires eye guard protection. These helmets are made of hard plastic with a wire mesh face guard. The face mask must have a center bar running from the top to the bottom. The helmet is designed to absorb repeated impact from hard, high-velocity projectiles, such as a lacrosse ball. A goalie helmet in lacrosse may add a throat protector as well. Lacrosse helmets use a four-point buckling system, both to ensure that they stay on and to allow for a better fit. Goalie helmets add a throat protector. Soccer headgear. Several companies have marketed headgear for soccer players to reduce concussion and other head injuries that occur from heading a soccer ball. This consists largely of a headband with foam padding. To date, the research has not supported the effectiveness in reducing the incidence of concussion from heading. However, it may protect against soft tissue injury from head-to-head -head contact collisions. As crazy as it is, headgear may cause athletes to play more recklessly because they feel a sense of security, and thus they may play more aggressively and increase their chances of injury. Soccer headgear has been marketed to reduce the head acceleration and thus the risk of concussion. However, research has demonstrated that female players have greater head acceleration during heading than males when wearing the headgear and thus are still at a greater risk for concussion.